downstairs with our candidate finishing up his last interview. So he's had, I think, about 13 hours of interviews and meetings today so far. He's ready for you. He's warmed up. <laughs> but, but he is wrapping up downstairs, and we'll be up in just a few minutes. I'd like to give you a little bit of information about the format. Um, what we'd like to do is have questions written on cards so that Jim, the moderator, can read them aloud so everyone can hear them. And they'll be heard on TV because we're uh, broadcasting. And then Dr. Taylor can respond to the questions. So I'm going to pass around index cards, and I also have writing implements if you need them. If you have a question that you would like to have asked, then we'll have those collected throughout the evening tonight. And Good evening, everyone. Um, those of you who are standing in the back, if you would please find a seat. There's plenty. And it's like church or synagogue, you got to come up front. And Bernard, I don't, would you rather remain seated or do you yeah, want to stand? I want to stand up. Okay. Everyone, thank you so much for coming. I'm Jim Hughie, and I'm one of the search consultants who's been had the privilege of assisting this community and school committee in the superintendent search. And tonight's format will be the same one we will follow for all three candidates. And we're asking you to write out your questions for this reason, and that is that I'm sure we're going to get duplicates that are in the same arena, and we want to try to get as many of them out as we can as long as the candidate is still able to stand. This is the last session of a 14-hour day, literally, from starting at 7.30 this morning. So uh, what the format will be this. We will ask the candidate to spend three or four minutes give you, giving you a quick intro about why this person would like to be your next superintendent. And then we'll uh, ask that you hand those cards in and a couple of people, including Laura. Laura, wave at them. Uh, who's also my spouse, but more importantly, is uh, also with the company. And then I will be the moderator and read the questions. And if I blow it, then stand up and say, read it again, because that isn't what I ask, okay? Um, and rather than me take a whole lot more time with you, I would much prefer to allow you to have the questions. So with no further ado, let's give a Brookline welcome to Dr. Bernard Taylor. Bernard. Well, good evening. Um, it, it is an honor and a, and a privilege for me to have spent the day here and uh, to have learned a lot about this community and it, this school district. And I, I had the great fortune, the best part of this interview process has been the interaction I was able to have with the students. And uh, they are the best ambassadors for this school district because they ask great questions. 
Uh, they were engaging, and they made me feel very, very welcome. So I, I certainly want to thank you all for um, allowing me to, to have the privilege of meeting them as well. Um, I, I come to you as a superintendent who has served in three very different communities across the country. Uh, I began my career in education in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania as a classroom teacher. I, I started at the high school level and then went to graduate school and did some other things and then was hired um, as a sixth grade replacement teacher. And what that meant is I took over the classrooms of teachers who went for six weeks of intensive professional development in what was known as the Greenway Middle School Teacher Center. And um, so I went into, as a teacher went out for training, I went in and took over that teacher's classroom. I did that for one year. And then I was hired as a sixth grade teacher at the Prospect Multicultural Center, which was, at that time, the uh, district was um, in the beginning of its initiative around multicultural education. And so this school was organized around those concepts, and I was hired as a sixth grade teacher there. I taught sixth grade for four years, and I had a ball. I, I, I did. I thoroughly enjoyed um, teaching and the students that I worked with. I worked for a gentleman who was relentless about um, moving, me moving forward. So he badgered and cajoled me to go back to school to uh, get an administrative certification, and then I stayed and received my doctorate from the University of Pittsburgh, became the dean of students in that school, did that for a year and a half, then was promoted to being an elementary school principal of a very small magnet school, Westside Traditional Academy, 220 students, one grade of everything. Um, phenomenal experience. I worked with outstanding teachers, very small faculty, but they were outstanding. And, and the best part about it is we're still friends today. So they were very impactful. My life changed when I was moved from the best elementary school to what was purportedly the worst elementary school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which was, uh, which it, it, it had a technology, it was going to have a technology focused wild technology institute. And um, this school served uh, two of the poorest public housing communities in the city of Pittsburgh. Everybody was eligible for free and reduced lunch, 100% African American. It was supposed to be, uh, no one was achieving it. And so I was transferred. The superintendent called and said, uh, I'd be honored if you would take this position. And I said, well, I'm new as a principal. Uh, I, I just, I'm just getting my feet wet here. And um, it wasn't the superintendent who said that, but it was the director of human resources who, who is a friend. And she said, well, Dr. Taylor, if, Everyone is always making this, if you want to continue your employment with the district, you will accept the superintendent's offer. So I did. And I went with my hurt feelings and anger and said, I don't want to be here. And it turned out to, it changed my life. Because with the help of a, of a faculty that came from the land of misfit toys. So they had the land of the misfit principal and then the land of misfit teachers. They moved achievement in a mighty way. The school went from being considered to be one of the worst elementary schools to being one of the best in a very short period of time. And I want you to know how impactful that was because many of the teachers there had moved on to other positions. And there, so when, when you walk into a classroom of a family member, and that family member's teacher is somebody you work with, that lets you know that the seed you plant, you never know when your harvest may come in. So I felt very, very happy that these teachers that I had the chance to work with who moved achievement in a mighty way and helped kids who no one thought could be successful become inordinately successful. Um, it, it, was, it, it, it is the most rewarding work that I will probably ever do, and, and I am proud of that work, proud of that experience, not for anything that I've done or did, but it was because of the phenomenal work of the people that I had the privilege of working with. I was asked then to go to Kansas City, Missouri. My, the deputy superintendent was my supervisor in Pittsburgh, so he asked me to come and supervise half of the elementary schools. And um, I, I was reticent at first. Um, nobody wants to leave the comfort of home, but uh, I made the decision to, to pack up, lock, stock, and barrel, and move to Kansas City, Missouri. 
And if you've been, Kansas City is a great city. I, I, did, I did grow to uh, really enjoy living there. I uh, was supervising half of the elementary schools, had some other responsibilities, and then in April 2001, the superintendent and his entire leadership team resigned en masse. So the chief technology officer, chief legal counsel, the uh, deputy superintendent, um, and one other individual. The only people left were myself, the chief financial officer, and the legal counsel for the district. They all resigned. Well, I mean, I'm sorry, she came later. So there, were only, there was myself and the uh, CFO. So everyone else left. I was asked to be the interim superintendent. I did not want that job, but again, was told if I didn't take it, I wouldn't have a job at all. So um, took that job. The, the district was going to be taken over by the state of Missouri. Legislation was being introduced to do that. So on my second day as superintendent, I am driving to the capital of Missouri to meet with the governor, the Senate Majority Leader, and the um, Speaker of the House. And I watched for landmarks when I was going, so I, I, because I wanted to see the same long, long, uh, landmarks when they were taking me back. Because as I said, if I didn't see the same landmarks, I knew that I was going to be left off in a ditch somewhere, and I was really concerned about that. Um, I had eight, an 18-month contract. And in 18 months, we had to achieve some level of accreditation which the district did. How it was done, it was an, it was a effort that was uh, where there were contributions by everyone. I was a neophyte superintendent. I had to, to learn as I was going. So it was a crash course in, in leadership, but I was assisted ably by many, many people. Um, that happened, so the district becomes provisionally accredited. We next moved into gaining unitary status. Kansas City, the Kansas City, Missouri School District had been involved in the longest running DSEG case, one of the longest running DSEG cases in the history of the country. And if you go back and watch a 60 Minutes clip, you will, you will learn how much money was spent on desegregation efforts that many people felt didn't yield much. But um, the district was declared unitary, so that was year three. So first superintendency, 18 month contract, get accreditation. Then next two years, get us to unitary status. Now mind you, I'm still learning this and I was new to Kansas City. So if you need evidence of divine intervention, I, I can give you some examples. Okay. Um, so I, I, I stayed there for uh, six years. I'm the longest serving superintendent in Kansas City to date. They had 22 superintendents in 30 years. I had the distinction of serving as serving twice because I had a, a day-long appointment. It didn't even last quite 24 hours. But well, <laughs> I was appointed as co-superintendent when the superintendent left. Well, he was fired by the board first. And then the federal judge reinstated him. So that happened on a Thursday. I was superintendent from Wednesday evening to Thursday afternoon. He came back Thursday afternoon. And then he left again on Monday. So I served, I've served twice. So, but I stayed there for, for six years, um, and uh, we, we parted on very good terms. They wanted to do their own superintendent search. They didn't pick me. So they wanted a new board. They wanted to do their own search, um, and we, we, parted, we parted as friends. I, I can still go back there and go in the building. My picture is still hanging up in the lobby. So I made the wall of shame, no, the hall of fame. So, um, <laughs> I'm, so. And then I moved on to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Grand Rapids is much like here. It is a beautiful, beautiful city in, in western Michigan. I bought a house there. I still have it, although a lot of people want to buy the house for something. Um, and, but again, Grand Rapids was challenged academically and financially. So I want, want to make sure that you understand the theme of my career has been fix it, fix it now, because we're either academically bankrupt, financially bankrupt, or both. So you see why this would be attractive to me. Um, went there, and, and Grand Rapids was, um, Grand Rapids was an anomaly because there was little to no public support for the district other than it approved um, a millage to repair and renovate buildings. But if you had seen the deplorable conditions that existed, they were almost shamed into it. Um, but there was no discussion of the academic improvement. So the board that hired me 
gave me the charge, move this forward academically. And uh, I took that very seriously. Um, it was also a time where the district's finances were such that if it didn't do some things differently uh, with respect to its finances, it, it could have been taken over fi for financial reasons too. So I had the perfect storm of lack of resources, lack of achievement, fix it, and it should have happened yesterday. So in the six years that I was there, um, we, we went about the business of doing that. Now, I, I, I stayed too long at the fair. Um, in 2010, all of the, the, the schools in the district, with the exception of the alternative schools, which there were four, and one elementary school made adequate yearly progress with respect to the NCLB. And I knew that should have been it, but um, you know how it is. Um, the song in Dreamgirls, um, it's hard to say goodbye. I, I emotionally could not detach. And so I stayed now in that time, um, the board members that selected me were either defeated for re-election or did not run for re-election. So new group comes in. They decide that they want to take less of the type of reform path that the previous board was on. And they wanted to go in a different direction. So I had a contract that would, I would still be there under the terms of the contract. No, I would have just finished up. So I would have been there because they, we negotiated, they renewed the contract in 2010 because it was set to expire in 2011. And they approved an evergreen contract, which means that in that contract, the language was as long as I received a satisfactory evaluation, it would renew itself to maintain a five-year term. And that's the kind of confidence that the board that hired me had. Well, this group fell off and the new group wanted to go in a different direction. So they negotiated, they wanted to negotiate a, a severance agreement. Now understand, I was entitled to five years worth of salary and benefits. And I chose not to um, exercise that option. I took considerably less. So as I said earlier today, we, I, I, we, we, there was a professional divorce. Um, they got custody of the children and I took the alimony and went to, to Baton Rouge. And um, any of you ever live in the deep south? That's why you live here now, right? <laughs> um, it wasn't a good cultural fit, but I, the work that was done there, I'm very proud of that work. When I got there, I was told the state was poised to take over four schools. So again, I had a deadline of you have one year to move these four schools out of harm's way or we're going to take the schools over that moved another eight so where they had lost seven schools in previous years to this day they didn't lose any financial challenges too first year had to cut 30 million dollars the second year was 22 but did that without layoffs and did that with still being able to maintain the programs that people value because they have very pure magnet programs and they have self-contained gifted programs that are very very expensive to staff so um, if you go online, you will see, one of the things I'm proudest of is they're building a new high school, which by your standards, um, they're spending, it's between 62 and $68 million. And that there is, is a big deal. And then I learned here, that would be considered peanuts. But go online and look for Robert E, look for Lee High School, don't look for Robert E. Lee High School. But uh, you will see. Um, it's work that I'm very, very proud of. But the reason why I'm proud of it is how we got to that point with the design and construction and the curriculum offerings for that building was through a very robust community engagement process. So I'm here because there, there's, the, what intrigued me about this is that you're growing, that there's public support for the school district. The Board of Education has a clear vision of its work and what it wants to see and your commitment to equity is not a lip service commitment. It is sincere, it is grounded in professional practice, and it is desirable that people want to see actionable outcomes. And that's what's drawn me to this. Um, I, I don't mind being involved in a fixing situation, and it's clear that I don't have any concerns about professional longevity. At the end of the day, what's important to me is that children have the opportunity to 
be in a situation where they can succeed academically and succeed as people, and that um, programs can be developed, schools can be built that best meet their needs. And that's why this is, this is very, very attractive to me. After meeting the students, though, I couldn't think of a better reason to be their best advocate, short of their parents. So that's why I'm here. I hope that um, uh, if you have questions, please ask them. Believe me, they have questions. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, if, if, we're going to make, if we're going to make this work, I'm going to say my questions in 20 seconds, and you're going to have 90 seconds to answer. Oh, God. How's that? I feel like um, uh, Steve Harvey is going to get the Miss Universe. <laughs> <laughs> it went wrong. It's the only is there going to be a little ding? <laughs> it's the only way we can come close. And okay. I know you're exhausted, okay. so we're, we're going to make this well, work. Well, this lady said she'll kick me if I'm thinking. We, put, we ought to back up, too. Those two, are, <laughs> if we back up one step, they, they won't get a stiff neck. That's okay. There we go. Oh, okay. Be besides, we got to watch for the okay. camera here. Okay. Um, I didn't know we were on TV, so smile. Oh. Uh, <laughs> then, I guess let's start with this one. What I, we're lumping some together, so if your question doesn't get answered, raise or get asked in the right way, raise your hand or whatever. Um, I think you've answered this to a high degree, but basically the question is two part. The first part I, I think you answered, but I'd like to have you extend sure. it because it fits right in. Sure. And it says, could you explain, <laughs> I don't have good hands and I played in too. Mm -hmm. um, it says, could you explain your recent employment history, which I think you did to a high degree, then why do you feel that those experience in those districts would translate into something that you can offer Brookline and what would that be? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I think that the preparation that I've had has enabled me to work with a wide uh, variety of students because I've worked with a gifted and talented population. I've worked with ELL, an ELL population, a special ed population, students who come from impoverished backgrounds, students who come from middle to upper middle class backgrounds. So I think that the type of, of what's represented here is not different from uh, other places I've worked. I think what's different is, is that you see things are changing here. Your demographics are changing, the size of the district is changing, the demands on the district are changing. And what I see, which I, I feel that I have an excellent background to handle, is how to help you move forward so that you don't, and I don't think that would ever happen here, but you don't fall where you're playing defense. You're playing offense and you're winning right now. So how do you keep up a winning offense? And I think I, think I can bring an outside perspective about how the excellence here can translate into actionable things that can be a benefit not only here, but to other districts too. But I, but I know you, you have a desire to, to improve upon what you do well. I don't think anybody here is content to rest on your laurels. So I, I think when you're doing well, you always want to figure out a way to, to do what you do well better. And, um, I think there's a, a lot of very smart people here, and I think that they want to work hard to, to keep the momentum going of, of, of continuous improvement. Thank you. That was close to 90 seconds. Yes, you're get, so you're getting you threatened there. to kick me. Uh, <laughs> um, this one is, uh, we, was asked by many in several ways. Um, based on conversations you've had today and what you've done, I know you've done your homework about the district, what do you see as your top three priorities when you arrive, and how would you go about in the first 90 days to six months, doing something that would address those three top priorities? Well, I, the three top priorities that I have would, would come about as a result of the priorities that have been established by uh, the select. Um, the superintendent had to make actionable the priorities of, of the board of So this is, I would not go rogue and come up with something that wouldn't be consistent with what is consistent with the strategic plan, the district's mission and vision, and the goals that are enumerated in the various plans that already exist. That's my goal. Number two is to go out and talk extensively with principals, with teachers, with parents, with students about what they see as the need of the district that are consistent with the priorities that have already been established. And then the piece would be to come up with an action plan 
that looks at how resources both financial and human capital, so that um, a plan could be developed that would be articulated after the involvement of numerous stakeholders in its development, and then how there would be a report on progress, whether it's at, it's a, it's a, if it's at a select committee meeting, or whether it's through public forums, or whether it's through something like this. It would be how do we keep the public informed about the progress we're making relative to whatever plans emerge that are consistent with the priorities established by the select. Good job. <laughs> keep that up. Yes. Sir. Um, we have also we had a number of questions asked on Facebook, so I'm going to recognize that and also ask one of those because it ties into a number of others. Um, and this one is, what do you think you can bring to Brookline that nobody else could bring to Brookline? That's a good, now that's a very good question. I can bring Bernard Taylor and his experiences, um, his knowledge. Um, I, I know that I will bring you hard work. I know that I will bring you a commitment, a deep, heartfelt commitment to children and their success. But what I'm going to bring to you that I, I think no one else, I know no one else can bring this is, is Bernard Taylor Jr. Okay. This other one, there were two or three people that asked that and I found it interesting. Um, tell us the most humorous situation <laughs> that has happened to you in your experience as a superintendent and what did it teach you? <laughs> I've had a lot of humor. I, th I think that the, it wasn't funny at the time, but I, I do laugh about it now. I, I dealt with a, a retiree insurance issue. I have an inordinate respect for senior citizens, particularly around anything to do with the benefit that the district provides. But we, we were having some pretty long drawn out contentious uh, conversations around moving um, Medi Medicare eligible retirees to a Medicare Advantage plan. And so at one of the first meetings that I went to, I was called a Yankee carpetbagger. <laughs> and I was, I was like, I, I was, I, you know, I was like, Yankee carpetbagger? Well, what kind of gone with the wind kind of nonsense is Because I do remember, I, you know, I, I, I forget who it was. I don't, I don't know which character and going with the wind said that, but I'm thinking, really? A Yankee carpetbagger? Um, I had to laugh about it, but, well, at the time I didn't laugh about it, but afterwards I saw the lady who said it, and she, I said, well, am I still a Yankee carpetbagger? She said, I'll just call you a Yankee for right now. So, <laughs> so but I, I, I've learned that you have to develop a sense of humor. You, 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 you really, especially, especially in um, public meetings, because people say, I don't have a poker face either. I've, I've gotten better at it though, I do, I, I, I promise, I've gotten better at it. Because people will say things, and you know how your eyebrow goes up and you're like, whoa, that was, <laughs> that's intense. So um, I've gotten better at it, but, but it, it's one, I've, I've had a lot of humorous moments, but the, usually they involve kids, especially, I, I had a little kid tell me that she didn't like my tie and the color wasn't right for me and I needed to go and change it. I was mad because I said, well, I thought the same thing, but a little kindergarten student <laughs> confirmed it. So um, that was good, though. That was good. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that was a good question. Um, yeah, the, this is a bright group of people. You'll learn that quickly. Um, please tell us about your track record in increasing the diversity of staff and especially in leadership positions in your previous roles. Um, I, I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to preface this by making sure that people understand I try to find the best people I can. Um, and I don't, I don't, I know that's an issue, but I need to make sure of two things. One, you have a heart for children, um, and that you are going to work tirelessly to make sure that they achieve. So th those are the two things that I look for, listen for, research, Google, and everything else. Um, I know you have to cast a wide net to find um, the highest caliber of I'm sorry, highest caliber of, of, of staff. And I think in, 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 it would be 
easy to attract people here because there's a lot to offer, but you have to also be conscious of what it takes to retain people. So uh, again, um, it, it's about, but it's about moving the work. And uh, I have, now I have found though that when you ask the right questions about people's experience, because if you've been a teacher, you're gonna, you're gonna talk to me about your results. If you've been a principal, I want, you should be able to get a letter of recommendation from teachers and students. I want the principal to be able to get a letter of recommendation from a student to say how impactful that principal was. I had someone ask for that and at first I was like, okay, now I have to think about who I would ask and whether they would remember. Remember, I taught sixth grade and it's been, my students are now young adults. I found, it, this is really fortuitous too, I, uh, the young man who wrote the letter of recommendation for me, um, his um, son attended the uh, same school as one of my nephews. And we, it was just by happenstance. And he started talking about something we did in the sixth grade. And this young man is in his early 30s. But he said, it, I remember it because it made such a difference. And so when he wrote his letter of recommendation, he sent me a copy of it. And he just said how it wasn't so much the in-class things that he appreciated, but it was the out-of-class support that he, he fit, said was equally impactful. So. Um, I look for head and heart. I want to know that you have the intellect to do the work, but you have the heart to do the work as well. Thank you. Forgive all my shuffling over here. <laughs> um, we have several key vacancies at the principal level and at the central office level. And what is your experience in hiring the best talent and then being able to retain that best talent and in between develop them, developing them and increasing their capacity? Well, I, I, again, I, I think it's about knowing what you need. Um, this is not a district that, I, that probably has a, a problem attracting top tier ca uh, candidates. But I think you, you have to be willing to go beyond what you typically do. So are you, is the district willing to advertise in, in other journals? For example, if it, if, if it wants to cast a wider net to get a more diverse applicant pool, is it doing so by making contact with for example, the National Association of Black School Educators or the organization that is uh, its counterpart for Latino candidates, things like that. If you want to increase the number of female administrators who are, who are working at a level other than the elementary level, are you contacting, for example, AASA and asking for their, their input around uh, top tier uh, female leadership that it that might be working in other districts and things like that. The piece about retain, retaining staff is you retain staff by empowering them to do the job they're hired to do, giving them the support they need, running interference when you need to, holding them accountable, but most importantly making sure that people have a clear view of their work, clear view of how successful that work is, and a clear view of what they're going to do as next steps to keep that momentum going around the quality of the work. Good. This is the most frequently asked question so far, but I would advise you not to answer it. Okay. How do you feel about Bill Belichick? <laughs> like Bill Belichick, except when he plays the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Sorry, that was an actually asked question. I, I couldn't pass that up. Um, <laughs> oh, that was not a fair one. <laughs> this, this one... It was asked by several people, um, and it was, I don't know who did that either. They didn't sign it. But I do want to, uh, this is a serious one, and that is, what is your overall vision? You've had a day now, 13 plus hours with Brookline. What would be your vision statement for the Brookline Public Schools going forward? Or the Public Schools of Brookline, forgive me for not <laughs> saying that right. Thank you. I think that... <laughs> You know what, and, and here's, here's why that is a good question, because I need somebody to act. And I think that the vision statement you already have, this is your mission statement, to ensure that every student develops the skills and knowledge to pursue a productive and fulfilling life, to participate thoughtfully in a democracy, 
and to succeed in diverse and, and evolving global society. But you had one other piece. We've changed roles. That I, that I really like, and that's every student is prepared for change and challenge. Change and challenge. So what does that tell you? It tells you that you know that these students are not going to live a static life of complacency and that they are going to have to embrace the fact that their world is going to change and that it, it will present challenges. But you're equipping them with the tools to be able to address change and to overcome any challenge. And, and that, I wrote it down because I had to say I like what that embodies. That, they, that you have to prepare students to accept change and challenge. And I wrote it down because it was that impactful for me. So my, my mission and vision statement and goals would be similar to what you have now. You did an excellent job in crafting those. And uh, uh, again, that push to, to address and, and, and handle successfully change and challenge, uh, I think that, that that would be a good starting point uh, for me. Okay. We've had several questions along this line, so I'm going to make it a two-part question. Uh, as you know, the teachers are working without a contract right now. Yes. So the question is, what would you do to help resolve that? And secondly, uh, what was your relationship with your teachers in, they, they asked Grand Rapids, but are with the Teachers Union in Grand Rapids, but you can tell it anywhere. So. Um, let, let's, the, my relationship with the teachers in Grand Rapids, I think, was, was one where... They said teacher union. I'm oh, sorry. I didn't say union. that a lot. I, I want to make sure that you... Had, I had a very interesting relationship with the teacher union president. Now, he, he came into office and he uh, declared war on me. I mean, not, you know, we hadn't met, but he came in with a very, very strident position about being adversarial because they, they had a collective bargaining process that was more collegial and that was working. But I think at the time there was a lot of pressure that was coming from Lansing uh, that was impacting um, school districts. There is a lot of animus towards the Detroit public schools. So anything that was done with respect to the D Detroit public schools impacted other school districts. The district was financially challenged. So this was the first time where teachers were not granted significant raises and where there were serious discussions that were held about uh, teachers contributing to, to the cost of their own health care. At, at that time, the district absorbed 100% of the cost for uh, teacher health care. Now, that wasn't true for every bargaining unit. Um, I, I think it was a tense time with labor because um, they, the uh, board had just voted. Now that happened before I, I became superintendent, but they had just voted to privatize bus service. And um, I, I think that there was a, 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 a sense of concern about what else would be privatized. So I, I, that's why I want to make the distinction between the head of the teachers union and the teachers. Because the relationship that I have with teachers in my, and this is not based on just supposition on my part, but it was their willingness to engage in, in, in a new professional development process that we received considerable outside funding for. Um, later on in my tenure, we received a grant from the Kellogg Foundation for us to work in, par in partnership with the National Equity Project. And teachers were instrumental in helping us get that grant and were engaged in the planning of what would happen to implement that grant. So um, it, it was contentious. I'm, I'm not going to, to try to sugarcoat that. But it wasn't contentious with the teachers. And, and I think that there's a better appreciation for what was done to keep the district ahead and to influence some of the legislation that, that resulted as a result of the push for teacher reform when um, the current governor of Michigan um, came into office. Because when he came into office, um, the governorship changed from Jennifer Granholm, who was a Democrat, to um, becoming a Republican governor and a very conservative Republican, both House and Senate. So the types of things that were being proposed, uh, you, if you, Michigan is now a right to work state. Uh, teacher uh, tenure reform passed without, without any problem. And it significantly diminished uh, the, the, the power of, of teacher unions. 
in Michigan. But my goal was to keep as much of that from being detrimental to the work of teachers as, as I possibly could in the role that I had. So that's why I want to make a distinction between the teacher union president, Mr. Paul Helder, and the teachers. Because um, I think if you caught Mr. Helder, he might say some nice things now because I've been gone for a while. But um, he didn't like me, and I prayed for him. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not laughing at your response. I'm laughing at the last question. I can't ask that one. Um, tell us what you know about the needs of Asian and Asian American students in Brookline, and also how would you address their particular needs? Well, I, I think Asian and Asian American students, I, I, again, there may be uh, l language issues that have to be dealt with depending on how long they've been in the country or what they're here for. So I know that, that this is the second largest a minority student, it's the second largest student population in the district. And uh, again, I think some of the issues are cultural because we had a question about um, the issue of the model minority and, and what the implications of that would be um, for students. I know that there are issues around the inordinate amount of pressure that these students feel to perform at an excellent level at all times. So I know that there are issues that we have to deal with that, you know, deal with the cultural variables that, that are associated with that. Um, I think the other thing, too, is to make sure that we don't confuse the, uh, by lumping everybody as Asian because there are differences that we have to look at, whether someone comes from Korea, Japan, China, uh, Laos, Vietnam, or whatever you want to say. So I think, again, I, my experience in working with, with students has been working primarily with, with students um, whose native language is Spanish. In Baton Rouge, we had a significant influx of students who were coming from Central America. So my, that has been my experience, working with uh, students primarily from um, Central America and from other uh, Spanish-speaking countries and students immigrating from Africa. So there, th there would be a learning curve, but I would defer to experts who would present themselves so that I had the best insights into what, what the community feels it needs so that those children feel better, sir. Okay. Thank you. We had probably nine questions about the increasing student population, ranging all the way from what will you do with the high school Burgoyning, uh, Burgoyning population, all the way to saying, where would you put the ninth school? I'd put <laughs> um, the ninth school uh, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would. <laughs> you don't need to answer that one. I just thought, so you knew the range. I'm not giving you all the tough ones right up front. I would put it in Foxborough Stadium so that you could have front row seats to the Patriots game. I knew you'd have a creative answer. Um, but do talk, about, do talk about how you would approach the whole population explosion situation in terms of student growth here and any experiences you had that might lend to that. Well, I, I've been fortunate that in, in both Grand Rapids and in uh, East Baton Rouge Parish, they had robust building and renovation programs. Um, uh, you know, I, I hate saying the name of this school, but go online and look for Lee High School in East Baton Rouge Parish because I'm very proud of what um, is going to be, what students will experience there because um, Again, I think that the, the, what went into the design and construction of that building was not only what academic needs can be met now, but it was, it was intentional to look at what that building could look like 10 years from now if it had to be repurposed, 20 years from now, if it had to be repurposed depending on the curricular needs uh, uh, at those times. So that would be the type of mindset that I would want to engage in. And how, how the, the, the district got to that point is it was very intentional about community engagement around the guiding principles about what the school should be. So instead of, and please don't take this as me being critical of your process, but I think that um, what I would suggest is a community conversation that enumerated what are the guiding principles that we're going to use to make a decision about this building. And Whatever decision emerges, if it's consistent with those guiding principles, there has to be an agreement among everybody who's party to the discussion that if it's consistent with those guiding principles, 
and this is the decision that's made, I think people have to be willing to live with that. Are you going to make everybody happy? No, you're not. Can you maintain green space or open space in perpetuity? No, you can't. But you can make these facilities, uh, you can, the design of the building can support um, environmental concerns and a community use because you can look at, okay, if you're going to sacrifice green space, can you build walking trails on the campus? Um, can you make sure that if, if there are trees, now in, in, in Baton Rouge, there are magnificent magnolia trees everywhere. A concerted effort was made. If, if we needed to move the trees and replant them, that decision went into the plan and design of that building. Um, the other piece is these are community facilities. So how can you incorporate into the design of the building a community use need? Could it be a library? Could it serve as um, a gym where senior citizens could go after school and use the walking track? I think if you incorporate into the design of the building something that appeals to a community's need for recreation space, you might be able to, to rectify this problem. Thank you. This one is a two-part question, but the first part I think you've answered, but I'm going to read it all because it kind of fits together. Um, if somebody were to go and ask the teachers, administrators, and parents in the communities where you've already worked, what would they say about you? Um, they would, I know that they would tell you that I am a, oh, a, um, I always think I'm supposed to sing when I do this. <laughs> um, they would, <laughs> if I hadn't been talking all day, I, I could, I could give you a tune. <laughs> you would um, sing James Brown's I Feel Good right there, right? <laughs> that part is true. Okay. Um, or at least rap it, because I don't know, <laughs> I don't want to rasp it out. Um, I, I think that people will, will tell you that I worked tirelessly to uh, make sure that children achieved. Uh, I think that people will also tell you that I was a, I'm a good financial steward. Um, part of my indictment in Grand Rapids is that people called me a conservative Republican because I didn't want to spend any money. And, and I, 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 I did take that as a compliment because there's nothing further, I'm not conservative about many things. So. I did take that as a compliment. I, I want to be a good financial steward. Um, I think that people will tell you that I'm innovative and that I, I will look for various ways to, to solve a problem um, and that I'm accessible. Um, when you stand on a street corner, wait, let me preface that because I, I don't want anybody to think I was just standing on a street corner. But we had count day in Michigan. So you had to hype it up to make sure that on that day, that was the one day you wanted to make sure every child was in school. So the day before, I would go to one of the busiest intersections in Grand Rapids and stand there with a sign that said, make sure your child is in school tomorrow. It's count day. And, and none of my predecessors ever did that. I mean, and I had to be talked into it because I said, I'm not wearing a silly hat or one of those big fingers or something. I'm not doing that. The sign was, was intriguing enough. But you would be surprised at how, how that resonated with people. You know, people were blowing their horns. And, and uh, we did, a, we did a, um, a, a walking tour before school. You go knock on doors and just say, hey, um, we're, I'm just welcoming your, your child back to school. Do you have any questions or things like that? And the look of shock when you knocked on the door, because at first people thought I was Publishers Clearinghouse. And I said, do you see any balloons here? So uh, it's not Publishers Clearinghouse. It's just the Grand Rapids Public Schools. Um, I think people would, and, and, and the things we did to engage parents, we had picnic, uh, park parties. Um, 3,000 people would show up. And we were just passing out information and, and school supplies. I mean, but that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. I, I just never looked at it as anything other than I had to be the best salesman and ambassador for the school district that I could be. Okay, well, the second part of this is, after you've done that, please talk to us and convince us that you have the ability to work with the variety of opinionated people. I don't know where that <laughs> comes from. It can't be Brookline. And make a decision and stick with it. Um, I, I, I think I said this earlier. Um, having worked with 
well. The boards I've worked with were, were much more political than I had the sense that um, this group is. I'm talking about these are my constituents, and you are creating a problem for my constituents. And I had to remind them, but I'm your employee doing what you have charged me to do. Um, so I think that what makes this attractive is that um, the select committee has priorities. And you don't have to guess what they are. They articulate them. You have a strategic plan that gives clear indication of the policy direction that this elected body um, is charged with making sure is brought to fruition. I didn't have that luxury in some of the other places where I worked. Or if, it, if politically it became difficult, I watched people do this. I watched them back up. Um, I, in, 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 and and, and this, is, this, is, this was very in, informative to me because legislative, uh, uh, legislation was introduced for two years in East Baton Rouge that would have allowed one of the most affluent parts of the school district to break away and form its own school district. Before I signed the ink on my contract, I am testifying before the Louisiana State Senate and the Louisiana House of Representatives as to why this, is, this would be detrimental. Now, it, it was a Herculean effort to, to fight that legislation, but the district prevailed. But the politics of this, if you, if you think that anyone stood and patted me on the back for that and said, that's a, a job well done, there were people who wanted it to go through, but didn't, on the board, but didn't tell me. So I'm thinking I'm doing the right thing. And there were people who were saying, no, 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 this, we, we, we didn't want you to do it. Well, I have to take my direction from you. So if, if, if I'm fighting the fight and you didn't want me to fight, you have to tell me. It was the right thing to do, and the district prevailed, and it is better for it. But did it mean that politically, it, it cost me support. So I, I feel that the clarity that is provided uh, around what needs to be done, even in situations where there are a variety of opinions. Again, let me, let me take you back to what I think is the best way to get to the end result. We know where we're starting with the priorities that have been established. So we know where we're starting. There's no guesswork about that. We know where we want to get to. There's no guesswork about that. So now it's, how do we get there? And that's where, collectively, you can have as many voices as you need to have so that everyone feels involved in the process, involved in what needs to be done. And then when you get to the end result, hopefully people will see that their voice is reflected in whatever emerges as the plan of action going forward. So that's why I think this would be a, a much different experience than I've ever had, ever had. But that's because you have a functioning elected group of representatives. Now, there's a difference between an elected group of representatives and a functioning group. And they're nice people. They're not, uh, salt of the earth. I like them individually, but they provided no direction for me. And when I tried to assume the direction, um, there were hits and misses. And the things that were hits were great, but the misses, I think, cost me in the end. This was probably the, thank you. This was probably the, I have to say thank you, Mr. Moss, so you can take a deep <laughs> breath. You need to get your water? No, I'm fine. Okay. I'm fine. thank you. Uh, I'm amazed at two things. One, he doesn't need water. Maybe that's why, but he must have an elementary school bladder. <laughs> He's only had to go to the restroom twice all day. There you go. Um, the, we've heard, we've had a lot of questions around diversity and increasing the diversity of staff. We ask you one around the, for the leadership element, but this one was more inclusive, so I pulled it out of all the others that asked the same kind of questions. And how would you, ch 
Excuse me, how would you change the hiring practices for teachers in Brookline so that our faculty looks more like our students? For example, in Baker K through eight, we have one teacher of color. We need help, so. Um, I, I think what you have to, to be mindful of is that there are other things that have an impact on your ability to hire uh, any teacher. First of all, you have to look at the pipeline of teachers who are eligible to be hired. Now, one issue that I know is a real one, and it is not just here, but it is throughout the country, is how many, um, how many, te how many prospective teachers get stuck because they have not passed the practices exam. So there are, are, are young people who are on the trajectory to graduate with a degree in either elementary education, secondary education, whatever you want to say, but they can't pass the praxis. Well, if you can't pass the praxis, you can't be certified. And unless No Child Left Behind has been amended, um, if you don't pass the praxis, you're not going to meet the, the you're not going to meet that highly qualified designation, and many school districts can't hire you. So part of this is is helping um, candidates, particularly um, minority candidates making sure that they're passing that praxis and doing it in a timely manner, not waiting till they're in your senior year or the se second semester of their junior year. But it's looking at how soon can they take it, how soon are they prepared, and are, is, is the pipeline of support there so that they can pass it. I think the other thing too is you gotta cast your net far and wide. I, there are excellent colleges here that are prepared, preparing people to be teachers. And I know that that hiring can be insular where you, you look at who's closest around you. But it does mean looking at, there's a program that um, places those who are, uh, who were uh, soldiers, who want, who want to be teachers. You may look at um, programs like Teach for America for your heart to staff areas. I, I, the issue with Teach for America for me is I want people to stay. And generally, a Teach for America uh, uh, candidate stays for two or three years, so I, I really, look at that a little bit differently. But um, relationships, I have a relationship with Southern University School of Education. I was an adjunct professor there. So it would be great for me to be able to pick up the phone and call someone and say, there's a potential vacancy here. Why don't you come up and explore what it might be like to, to work in Brookline, Massachusetts? Um, but it is about casting that net far and wide. And then looking at the pipeline here to see what can be done in the district to cultivate prospective teacher candidates. How many of your students that leave your high school, how, is the question asked, do you plan on becoming a teacher? And could, could consideration be given to giving preference to an alumni of the, of, of the district to come back and be a classroom teacher? Thank you. Um, this one is, we had several like this and I found an interesting <laughs> way to ask it. Given all the superintendent openings in our all over the country, and by the way, there are 16,000 school districts and a third of those superintendencies turn over every year. So there's a lot more vacancies than there, than there are applicants. And the current state of affairs in the Brookline Public Schools, why do you want to come here? Uh, well, first of all, okay, uh, let me be clear. Uh, my sojourn to the Deep South is over. So uh, if it's south of the Mason-Dixon line, I'm not applying for it. Um, I'm not going too far west. It's, it's just, I, look, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an East Coaster. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I like the four seasons. Snow doesn't bother me. So uh, I just culturally know that being close to Boston, New York, and Washington, D.C. Uh, work best for me. Uh, I have family considerations around that, too, so uh, that's important. Um, this is a challenge. I, I this, cha this would be a challenge, and it would be a good challenge because it would be a chance to do creative work. Uh, it's not reclamation work, it's planning work. I, I mean, I have a master's degree in public administration and, and part of that work was around planning. So I'm intrigued by the, the opportunity to be engaged in a concerted effort around community engagement to plan for what's next. And uh, growing excellence will give insights that can be exported to other school districts. And so that's what makes this uh, appealing. And, and don't get me wrong, your size is, is, this is growing. This is not small to me. It's not small. Geographically, it, it has its contained. 
but whether it's 42,000 students or 8,000 students and growing, I don't think anybody here who's an administrator goes home at 4 o'clock. I mean, I think people are probably working from 8 to 8, so or 8 to 9. So um, it's just a different type of work. But it's no less intense and, and, and no less challenging. It's just different. This one's a personal question, but legal to ask. Um, what do you do when you're not working? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. I, um, I, I'm on more of a structured exercise program. Not, I don't have any health issues, but um, I, I know what happens if I don't. And it's, it's therapeutic. It's relaxing. Um, I did win a local version of Dancing with the Stars, so I, I, <laughs> so I, I, I do get hoodwinked every now and then into um, ballroom dance. I'm not good at it at all, but um, it keeps peace, so I, I try to do that. Um, I do sing, so, but I'm not quitting my day job. So, uh, and, and I have a, a very large family of very small children, and they keep me, <laughs> they keep me really, really busy. It seems like no sooner than one set becomes of age, there's a replacement set. So um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the good uncle that does all the fun stuff. So, you know, I, I, I know how to, ha I, any wild, crazy thing that a kid wants to do, they sucker me into doing. Yeah, Please don't know. expand on that <laughs> anymore. No, I'm, the zip lines and all that kind of stuff, I, you know, okay. I, I do all that stuff. Okay. Then switching gears, what do you see as the role of central office versus the role of the school leader? Um, the role of central office is to support um, school leaders um, and to provide them with timely assistance when it's needed, whether it's in terms of uh, financial issues, professional development, instruction, uh, purchasing, things of that nature. Um, central office is a support. Um, principals should be empowered to manage their campuses. And that's what I want. I want central office staff to always empower the principal to manage the campus. And I, and I, and I don't mean that on a cursory level. I'm, I'm talking about the instructional program, the finances, the community engagement, the policy and procedures. If I, when a principal is hired, I trust that person to run that campus and central offices to support. Okay. Um, you have to limit this to two. Yes. Okay. Can you give two examples of severe conflicts that you've been involved in? <laughs> <laughs> and how did you resolve it? Um, again, it, it, severe might be a, a too, too difficult a word. But it, it was that issue around retiree health care. Um, and why it was serious is, is that for some it, re, it, it, it represented a betrayal on the part of the district to take care of them. Um, and they talked about that they accepted years of low pay. And so as they got in, into a, a time in their lives when they were on a fixed income, to have something that they valued taken away was, was very, very frightening. And, and I think when you're, when you're caught upon to make a business decision, um, you sometimes lose sight of the human element. But in sitting down and talking with these retirees and helping them talk through it, what are your concerns? What do we need to make sure we address? I think we came up with a, re uh, with a, a solution that allayed their fears, addressed their concerns, and demonstrated a true commitment to make sure that they, they would not be left in a position where they didn't feel that people cared about them. Um, I think the other piece was about this breakaway legislation. And then it morphed into something where um, the legislation was in a, a principal empowerment bill, which basically would have given the principal control over contracts for busing and food service and accounting and things like that. And so I had a group of principals saying, but we don't want this. So it was, how do you work to engage them so that they took up the fight about 
what they would be charged with as principals and giving them that support. But to, to have a legislature basically craft legislation that was aimed at only one school district in the state, um, that showed me just how, how I don't even think mean-spirited describes this. But it, it meant people rallied and pulled together. And, and when it was, it should have passed because both the Senate and the House are uh, of one party. But when you saw defections, I was, th I was there in the state capitol when that vote was taken, and you saw major defections on the part of the uh, majority party. That's how I knew uh, we did the right thing. Very good, thank you. Um, what is your, you've spoken to this a lot today, but th this is a new audience for it. What is your philosophy when it comes to special uh, education and students with learning difficulties? Uh, students with learning difficulties are no different than students without them. You have to push them to achieve um, at levels that are commensurate with their abilities. But um, it doesn't mean that you water things down. It doesn't mean that, you, that your expectations should be diminished for them. It means that you find multiple pathways for those students to demonstrate what they, what they know and you provide them with the support they need so that they can thrive and grow academically. The inclusion model that you have here is the, the way to go. It's not, it would be nice or this is great that you do this. The fact that you have inclusive practices, the fact that you have co-teaching, the fact that those things work, um, those are the types of exemplary best practices in, in, in special education that I think more districts should emulate. So I, I think that from what I observed today, I think uh, those students who have special needs are, are being taken care of in a manner that can only be enhanced. But, I, but I'm impressed by what I've, I've learned and what I've, I've seen thus far. Okay. We have two more questions and then, so if your question isn't asking these two, raise your hand and Give Laura that one, and then there's one other person who has a deviation from our rules, and I'll let you take a vote about that before we do it. Uh, this will be, we'll be modeling the town hall meeting for everybody. That was humor, but we'll, mm. didn't work. Um, this one is, I have to read it because it has multiple parts. Teaching children to be critical thinkers and to have the ability to evaluate data and information has always involved a broad education in the humanities. How do you continue teaching that skill and apply it in a modern technology world and where testing in, in certain subjects overrides the ability to teach those? Uh, it's, it's through how the professional development that's um, provided for teachers pushes students to be taught in a way that, uh, that pushes them to those higher levels of cognition. So I, I observe for our students engaged in analysis in, in terms of classroom discussion, in terms of their assignments, in terms of their homework? Um, are they called upon to do projects where the evaluation of data, the synth synthesis of data, is something that's expected? Students can do this. I saw this today in a kindergarten classroom. When a kindergartner can explain to you the difference between a healthy food and an unhealthy food, based on the introduction of the lesson. Now, mind you, the teacher was just introduced, and she was talking about healthy cereals. So she had the kids bring in examples of a healthy cereal. The question that I asked is, how do you know that a food is healthy or unhealthy? These, this was a kindergartner. He, his analogy was baked chicken versus fried chicken. He said, my mother has told me that baked chicken is better, is healthier, but that she likes fried chicken. It's her no-no food. So, so, I, so I want you to think about that. He may not be able to articulate how fried chicken is made is, is, is not as healthy in its preparation as baked chicken is. But he, he knew that when his mother said it's a no-no food, that there must be something about its preparation that would make it unhealthy. That's analysis. So that's what you have to, that's the kind of discourse that you engage with students in class. And I don't care how young they are, they can make evaluative decisions. When, they, when you say, do you like chocolate ice cream or vanilla ice cream, you don't leave it at, well, when they say I like chocolate, why? So every question, they should be asked why and prove it. If you
you say 2 plus 2 is 4, how do you know it's 4? Prove it. And watch kids go all in a circle about that. It's like everybody knows 2 plus 2 is 4. But prove it, prove it to me. How do I know that you know 2 plus 2 is 4? That's, a, and, and it's not, it doesn't have to be done. It's simply through questioning. It's simply through being intentional about the design of assessments and assignments where you push kids to think. And it's always, why? Prove it. How do you know? And if he asserts something, how do you know he's correct? What can you draw upon in your personal experience that would indicate to myself and your classmates that that is a correct assertion? It's intentionality. It's intentionality of the questions. It's intentionality of the lesson design. OK, we have one more question. But before we do that, I'm going to ask for a show of hands on this one. We have one person in the group who doesn't like the format. I understand why. And would like to ask their own question. If they're willing to ask that question in under 20 seconds, like I had to in reading them, and not go on for a lengthy time, but ask the question, would that be OK? Would everybody be OK? Anybody who objects to that? Anybody, let's ask another way. Anybody object to that? Yes. One. OK. Because you want the equal opportunity? No. OK. Now I'm stuck. <laughs> Is that fair? That's fair. OK, cool. All right, here's the last question. This is to show you, and then, the, and then I want you to give a closing comment. It, you can take up to whatever time you want, up till 10 till 9. Yes, sir. And this is to indicate to you the kind of intellectual capacity that exists in Brookline. It's also a test. Yes. What have you learned from the great Pittsburgh playwright, August Wilson? August Wilson attended the school as principal. What I've learned is... Put the mic up. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, his work talks about resilience. Um, his work talked about, talks about um, the strength of family. Um, his work talks about faith. And so what his work represents to me are things that I hold very, very um, dear. And that's, that's faith, um, that's family, and it's persistence. It's, it's, ne it, it's about not giving up and not being afraid. Um, you all have Googled me, so I'm sure you think I, I've traveled more than somebody who's on the Harlem Globetrotters. But I'm not afraid to take on an assignment. And if, if I was looking for longevity, I would have picked a safer career. I was a good teacher. And I was a good principal. And I could have stayed in, that, in those lanes and been very, very happy. But I'm glad I didn't. And, and um, I, like, I like happy endings, too. But the happy ending is that I know I made a difference in the lives of children whose, whose success is going to far exceed mine. I have a student who I mentored who became the youngest elected city councilman in the history of Kansas City. And if you knew his family background, you would, you would say, how did that happen? And this wasn't anything that was planned. Good kid who called me for advice, and we just maintained a relationship through, through his college years. And when he ran for office, I said, are you sure you want to do this? And when he won, he, he, he won very unexpectedly. He just got reelected. I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that young man. And I, I, I can't take any, any I'm not claiming any, any, any responsibility for his success. But that's the seed you plant. So um, I don't know if I addressed the question, but I, think I liked what I said. I <laughs> <laughs> Well, if that's, if that's the criteria, you succeeded. <laughs> okay, take, take a couple of minutes and give any closing comments you want, and then we'll let other people come up and have a chance to shake your hand and ask you any other question. First of all, let me, I, I want to thank Jim, you, and I want to thank, especially thank Laura, because 
I have never been involved in a process like this where from beginning to end, um, it was fun. It was fun. Preceding was a paid political announcement. Um, <laughs> the hospitality that's been extended to me um, is something that has exceeded my wildest expectations. This has been a fair process. If I'm selected, I'd be most proud and, and, and happy to serve. But if I'm not, I can say this. I, have, I know I've been heard. And I've been treated extraordinarily well and in and, and, and the most fair and um, comprehensive manner. Um, you have a lot to be proud of. And I hope you're telling your story. I hope you're going to conferences and presenting about the, the good things you do. I also hope you go, I hope you're writing about what you're willing to embrace in terms of how you want to get better. People need to know your story because there are a lot of people who, who don't think that a school district like this exists. The fact that you willingly take students from, from Boston, that you, don't, you could easily say, I'm not doing that. It, it is too risky. We don't know who we might get. You could close your borders and build a wall. <laughs> I'm glad you haven't done that. Um, what you do for special needs students, extraordinary. Exclu when you talk, inclusion scares people to death. But here, it just seems that it's a normal operating procedure. That's great. Your ELL students, do I think that, that, that when I see them opt out of ELL services, well, that's at something. But your willingness to embrace taking on the work around the racial achievement gap, and that's not just lip service work, is what sets you apart from many, from, from any school district that I know of. And, and I wish you were part of the Council of Great City Schools or, or, or an organization like that, because again, you need to tell your story. I hope you go to the National School Boards Association and present. If you're in a mid-sized uh, association of schools, please tell your story. Um, I wanna also say to the staff that I met, but the central office staff, I have been so thoroughly impressed by those people in the short time that I've met them because they were willing to talk about the things they do well, but their challenges. A lot of people wouldn't do that. No, but most people will never tell you what is a challenge because you know everybody wants to put on the best, the, the best face of what's going on. When I went in the buildings and, 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 and had the opportunity to talk with students, I don't care what grade they were from the youngest to the oldest. Impressive, impressive, impressive. So, I just wanna thank you all for coming out on a Monday night. I know you're probably missing something really good on TV that you usually watch. I'm glad it's not Thursday because I don't wanna compete with scandal on how to get away with murder. <laughs> but I'm so glad that you came. And, and I, I, you ask tough questions, but when you feel support, when you feel that people want to hear what you have to say, the time flew by. So it may have been 14 hours, but it really feels like 14 minutes. So the only thing I want to do is take these shoes off, but other than that, I've had a, I've had a great time. And that's compliments to these people, but to uh, it's a cool committee. these fine people as well. And I think, again, Thank you all so much for Thank your you time. Guys. If you have questions, um, I am dependent on, on a cab, but I'll stay as long. We're taking him out at 9.15, not taking him out in the wrong sense, taking, <laughs> taking him back to the hotel. He needs rest and we need rest, but come on up and he'll stay another 10, 15 minutes to answer individual questions. Thanks.